Here is Chris, who's going to tell us all about testing at FastMail. So please welcome Chris. Hello. My name is Chris. I work at FastMail, and this is my email address. All of the slides you see today are available at curiositykilda.cat. Um, and I'll put this up at the end again. So I'm going to start off by setting the context by introducing myself and the company I work for. Then I'm going to talk about all the testing we do at FastMail on our internal systems and Cyrus, our open source project. So I've previously done a whole bunch of testing at a couple of security companies and a company that makes telecommunications carrier class systems. Um, I've been involved in lots of different types of testing, performance testing, system testing, regression testing, all sorts of different types. There's a recent blog post about me. Um, if you care about those sorts of details, you can find out um, more there. So all that was in the UK. Uh, and then things happened, and I ended up in Australia. I realized my email company was a couple of minutes away from where I was staying in Melbourne city center. Um, the company started in 1999. In 2010, it got purchased by Opera. And a few years later, got repurchased uh, back out by the developers who, um, who work there. So it's now owned and operated by developers. The main open source project we contribute towards is Cyrus IMAP. Uh, you can find out more information about that at cyrusimap.org, and I'll talk about that later in the presentation. And we have a serious case of NIH syndrome, where everything at FastMail, from an extent, everything from outside the company, falls into one of two categories. It's either rewritten, or we write a wrapper to use the external thing. Um, so wherever we can, we write code. Uh, in the last three years since I've been there, the company has grown two to three times in terms of developer uh, count. And we, have, we don't really have a formal uh, release process. It really just evolves as new people join the company. So I'm not going to go through this list, uh, and I don't expect you to read through it. But to give you a scale of the sort of stuff, this is probably about half of the stuff we actually write. And there's a lot of things. NIH, not invented here syndrome, means there's a lot of things uh, for our test team to test. Um, all of these have to be tested in-house. So if you want to find out more about the company, if you want to have a play, that you can get a free 30-day trial there. So our technology. This is a bit of a simplification, but we've got the front-end product, so fastmail.com. Uh, this is a subscription-based service, so people pay us. We provide them with an email service. We've got a whole bunch of, um, we use a whole bunch of free things, so Nginx, uh, Debian, uh, and we write a lot of Perl in between. Um, and then everything's built on top of the Cyrus IMAP server. So all the messages, all of our, a lot of our customers' data is stored in Cyrus IMAP. Now I'm going to move on to testing about our tools and testing platform. Test. So this is our test device. These are our test devices. Um, the presentation is actually about automated testing, but we have a whole bunch of stuff we use for manual testing, going back to Firefox phones that are probably seven years old, right up to the latest uh, Pixel devices. Uh, I'm going to talk about FMQA, which is our internal test system first. And then I'm going to talk about Cyrus.works, which is the CI system for Cyrus IMAP. So FMQA, there's three parts. As I said, FastMail is a website. And there's three different ways in which we test it. We use Selenium to test the UI and the functionality. We use Link Checker to make sure all of the links work. And we have a screen comparison tool which goes through, takes a screenshot of every screen, um, and will tell us if anything has changed. So in the old days, we had to do a lot of testing. We had one test server. It wasn't really the best thing. It was Jenkins. Over time, I added more and more things. Um, and then one day, it died um, and took with it everything I had done over about a year and a half. Um, we also needed to run quite a lot of tests. So we used to use a third party provider who would provide us with browsers. And uh, then suddenly, they decided to start charging us money because we were using it significantly more than the free tier we were on. And we needed something new. So we got hold of this. This is a Blade Center. 16 machines. One of them is actually missing, but 16 machines just for testing. 
Um, we set up a network of Selenium Grid, Jenkins, Docker. Um, everything's now in Git, everything's in Docker, uh, and everything can be reinstalled within an hour. Um, and we can run way more tests than we're going to need to run in the next five or so years um, at no additional cost. So Jenkins, I had it set up originally where it was on the internet and I had a bunch of firewall walls where it would only allow me to access it if I was in the office or at home. It would deny every other IP address. Didn't really scale as more people joined the company and wanted access, more systems wanted access. Um, so I realized you can set up a VPN using just this command. In about two minutes, you can set up a VPN. Then when you go in and you run, after you've installed it, it'll ask you a couple of questions. When you run the shell script at the end, um, you can generate a certificate. It's very simple to use system. Um, highly recommend it if anybody is setting up a test network. So there's nothing more annoying than when you're using a company's website. You click something, it doesn't work as you expect. You then click the contact us button and you get this. Page not found. And then you're like, what do I do? I've had enough of this, I'm going. So broken links, there's no real need for them. You can integrate this as part of your CI. It's called Link Checker. Um, it's free. You can download it from this website. Uh, it'll go through, here's how it's set up in R. This is a bit of a simplified version, but here's how it's set up, um, can be set up in Jenkins. You do need to, it is a good idea to identify yourself with a user agent, so if your CI ever goes off on the internet, causes all sorts of problems, people can find out um, why their website keeps getting hit every few minutes. Um, so, Bort. So we have a, we use Slack, a fast mail. We use Bort to do, it's our Slack bot. We use it to do various admin things. So if we need to raise a ticket, we can get it to interact with um, Utrack, for example. We can get it to look up information on various servers or various customers. Um, you can download it here for free. It was written by somebody, um, yeah, a fast mail. So obviously, we used to use Jira. We weren't really, people weren't really happy with the speed of that. We then moved to Utrack. People weren't really happy with the UI of that. And so one of the things that Bort can do is um, interact with a third-party service, so we don't have to. So for testing, I cloned Bort and created TROB, which is Bort back to front. We needed an instance that could live on our test network and interact with Jenkins. Haven't open sourced this part, only Bort is open sourced at the moment, um, but if there's demand, I will do so. Um, so it can talk to Jenkins, and I will give you a demonstration, hopefully. So um, it's very simple. UI, you just say test report. What it will do is it will go off and check all the instances of Jenkins and tell you how things are looking. If you want to test something, say test beta. Then it will go off and it will say test started. Um, and if you want to find the status of something, you can say test report for something slightly more specific. And hopefully, yep, it will then give a link to the instance where you can see a whole bunch of tests are running. And, ah, the other thing it does, if I come back to Slack, It takes the Jenkins um, estimate for how long tests will run and then turns that into Australian Eastern time, adds a small amount of extra, um, a small percentage, and so tests should be ready in uh, about seven or eight minutes, hopefully. Okay. Okay. So, as we've grown, we've moved from people hacking away on production servers to actually having a release process. However, there are situations where people decide to release things without telling you, and when your job is to test those things, it's good to see what people are doing. So there's this tool called BBC Wraith, or it's called Wraith, it's from um, the BBC. It's free, it's open. Take a screenshot, and if anything, changes in the screenshot since the last screenshot, it will output, generate an output and uh, notify me in Slack. This is a simple and free tool to use, uh, SLE, uh, Slack T. You can pipe anything out to Slack um, and I'll show you what that, uh, the output of that looks like.
a, what it does, it generates this. Uh, this, this is all the free open source tool. Um, the spot part was the integration with Slack and our internal systems that upload it to um, our company's file storage. But what BBC Wraith will do is take a screenshot and then take a screenshot next time you ask it to do so um, and then just highlight what has actually changed. So you've got before, you've got after. In this case, the logo didn't load on time um, and a whole bunch of text changed and then it highlights the difference. This isn't supposed to be really readable, but just tells you what has changed in your UI. And there's screenshots just in case the internet didn't work. Okay, so for notifications, this light here, which I'll sh hold up and show you in a minute, I bought a couple of these a few years ago. I thought they were pretty cool things. I didn't know what to do with them, and then I found a use. Um, I made it so it monitors Jenkins, It'll, it'll, it'll be green if there's no problems. Uh, if there's one problem or a small number of problems, it'll go orange for a small amount of time. And then eventually it notifies me um, with a visual notification that I cannot ignore, uh, which I will now demonstrate. So for the 30% of you that are not Australian, in Australia, the ambulance is called an AMBO. And I, there was an ambulance sitting outside work, and I thought, ah, I got the idea for the notification light system from watching that. So having this in front of your face, it's pretty much impossible um, to, to ignore a failing test. If you want to download the source code for this, it's on just the flashing light bar. It's on the previous slide. I'll now unplug this so I can continue. Okay, Cyrus.works. Cyrus is an IMAP server. It's about 24 years old. Um, it's had people come and go over the years and contribute various different things. Um, my contribution is Cyrus.works, which is a Jenkins instance, which runs tests that are written by developers. Um, and I'm going to move on to that section now. So yeah, Cyrus is our back-end system. Um, it's entirely open source. If you want to run an IMAP server, Feel free to go and download um, and set one up. We've got developers working around the globe. Um, we have meetings every Monday. You're welcome to come and join. Cyrus.works, I'll give you, quickly show you what it works, what it looks like, and then I'll explain some of the setup procedure behind it. So you've got Cyrus.works, and you've got CyrusIMAP.org. As you can see, they look pretty similar. Okay. Uh, so the source code to set that up is all written in Perl. Almost everything we do at FastMail is written in Perl. But the source code, if you want, um, is there. It uses Jenkins inside Docker, which makes it a little bit easier to, to set up. Um, so whenever we, things go wrong, we can get back to a sensible state. So the way I did the theming, I used the simple theme plugin. Um, that's free. That's a Jenkins plugin. I used this theme generator, and then I did a find and replace to make sure the exact shade of blue was used. There's a blog post I've written on some security issues. So Jenkins inside Docker is great until you want to reach out to the host machine and run tests in Docker. You come across a bit of a, a bit of a complicated problem, which I didn't exactly solve, but I found a way that kind of works. And this is isolated enough from FastMail systems, so even if that machine does get compromised, it has nothing nasty on it at all, and it's, uh, sorry, it has nothing on it at all that could um, reach any customer data. It's 100% um, isolated. Um, so yeah, if you want to see the solution I implemented, feel free to take a look. So, in summary, all the slides can be found at curiositykillthe.cat. Uh, we've built a test system made up entirely of free and open source software. And yeah, QA can work around um, and support company culture. Are there any questions? It's a little bit faster than I thought it would be, but. <laughs> Sorry. 
Uh, when you're doing the network testing, what do you use um, to actually, do you emulate network connections or if you, having started in the era of Docker, you just use Docker for the, set up the actual networks binding to ports and all that kind of thing? My background is the Samba project where we have to, we fake all the things with socket wrapper and things. So is this, is this in fast mail or? For the IMAP stuff. Uh, the IMAP stuff. Um, yeah, basically there's a whole bunch of C unit tests. Mm -hmm. They, the process is it builds Cyrus um, and then there's a whole bunch of tests that connect to Cyrus on the local machine. Mm -hmm. So there's not really a network there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically. Um, so, so if the Cyrus works, it, it doesn't actually have a network, um, but that machine is on a test network. But yeah, Cyrus.works doesn't have a network. It's just done on, done on the local machine. It's just, you're just, so you're using, you're binding to loopback ports and yeah, I doing so. things on un unprivileged loopback ports and yep. things. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Sam Sam Samba's approach is to emulate the network with a, over Unix domain sockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which um, we ne we've got, yeah, we tend to in do more interactions. So I'm just interested to see what different projects in the systems like. Yeah, it, it was just simplicity, so developer can find it on their local machine without, you know, too yeah, much same, um, same reason complexity. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to know how many uh, users or projects you have using your uh, testing cluster there. Um, um, so I'm the only tester at FastMail. Um, there's only one tester. Um, but as far as users go, do you mean? Sorry? Yeah, so how many people are, will be running, will be doing, running tests or... Uh, uh, so this is actually a fairly, a fairly new thing. The whole, most of this has actually happened in the last six months. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to start using Vagrant this year. So at the moment, we've got a whole bunch of um, systems that are kind of live and they share the same backend. Um, all, we have about 20-ish developers, um, and we're going to have it set up so for all of their work, we can compile um, a branch that they've made and then run the same test that I've shown you today against that. So it's about 20-ish 20, 20 developers, one tester. Um, yep. And is it, what's the administrative overhead of maintaining your own sort of testing infrastructure there? It's taken a while to set up. It's definitely taken several months of my time where I've not been doing as much testing as I would like to have done. Um, but yeah, it's just when you have a small company, you know, it's a case of I have to stop everything and make this thing, otherwise I'm going to have a bigger problem in the future when we have you know, 40 developers and one tester. So, yep. Are, are you looking to, I know your, your light goes on if you break the build, but that's reactive. Yep. Are you looking to move to a continu continuous integration approach where code only lands after it passes the build? Yeah, so, passes all the tests? yeah so, so the, um, the flushing light used to just monitor a few production systems. Um, we're looking to extend that so it, mon it, use, it monitors um, things before they've gone to live systems. So yeah, using Vagrant, we're going to start testing individual developers' branches before they hit anything on production. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the next step in the project. Um, the response that you get back from Bort seemed to happen really quickly. Um, yep. Are you able to just quickly cover um, if it's hitting the Jenkins API directly, if you're using multiple slaves, uh, just, you know? Um, if, yeah. So on the test network, there's, there's a clone of Bort, um, and this is all in the Blade Center. Um, and that's basically just talking to a Jenkins, which is also in the Blade Center. So the machines are, you know, latency is going to be almost nothing. It's, it's two machines within. Obviously, it has to go via Slack and then to our Blade Center. But then when it gets to the Blade Center in New York, the machines are, are very close to each other. So there's no, um, there's no reaching back out and then back in again. So. And the load's extremely low. Like, there's not a lot of tests at the moment. Um, the only test, the only thing it was doing was responding to that command. So you've got an entire blade center that's practically doing hardly anything because most of the developers are here. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except those two. Are there any further questions? I finished a little bit faster than I thought it would be, so feel free to ask more questions. No questions at all? Yeah. 
A question at the back. Yep. Um, I don't know. You said it's all been very new, that it's only come up in the last few months and stuff. Have you, what's been the hardest thing with changing the, I guess, like dynamic in the office to either push developers to like getting used to using your back end and your new testing Jenkins environment? Part of it is um, even if they don't want to use it, just making it so I can test everything they've done in a very short period of time. So obviously Git, um, so GitHub is where all the Cyrus code is and that can talk directly to Cyrus.works. Um, the internal stuff we have Git and we have um, a slightly different way of doing that. But yeah, partly rather than changing the developers, it's a case of just making um, things so I can test things extremely quickly. Um, it's not uncommon for, you know, when you have a long history of not having testers and then testers suddenly come along, it's not uncommon for, for developers to say, come up you know, on a Friday afternoon and say, okay, I've made all these, these massive changes. I'm going to push this out soon. Can you test all this stuff? Um, and yeah, one option is to try and change the company culture. The other way is to actually just make things that test very, very quickly um, with no real limits. Um, so yeah. Is it, uh, is it just that, um, like, because you, you say you're doing it so fast, so you don't have to, I don't know if I'd say, get approval or make people aware of the fact that you're changing their code. It's just that they're, it's getting tested and then they'll get notified if for some reason it fails? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's really just company culture, I guess. It's, we, we, when, when the company is owned and operated by developers, you have a very different structure than when you have, you know, the traditional business model with, you know, um, all these external people and you have to, keep a whole bunch of different people happy. We at Fastmail want to release features very quickly. And sometimes, you know, some people have interactions with our staff. They find a bug and then it's fixed in about, you know, 12 minutes or something. Yeah. And the reason we do that is because, you know, you have developers who, who can, who, who understand the product very well. Um, and, and testing hasn't traditionally got in the way, uh, mostly because there hasn't been a history of testers at the company. Um, and you know, rather than stop everything that's been going on for, for 17 years now, it's a case of you can't really undo that, that culture. Mm. You have to simply um, make things that are fast enough to test within um, yep. the timeframes you have. We're both like government and large organizations, so change is slow and uptake yeah. on new tech or new um, workflows and stuff can be problematic, so I was just curious. Yeah, my last company had 23,000 people. This wouldn't have worked there. Yeah. But when you can talk to people, you know, when you can talk to everybody um, in the whole company, it's, yeah. it kind of does work, so, yeah. In terms of the Cyrus project, with, I've been doing all the tests on my own systems while we're waiting for this to come up, so if anyone pushes anything from after all, it's straight away and checks that it's good anyway. So that's kind of our stop campaign. Yeah. Uh, on that topic, um, I can speak from my experience. Um, once the, the tests are good enough that they start finding bugs in developers' code, developers will use CI to, um, to test their own work. And if you make it easy to push a commit that is not going to hit the, the, you know, the master branch, the feature branch, but it's just going to stay as a code review, developers will push to it so that they get a build and get a pass fail because it's easier than doing the tests on their own machine. Uh, you sort of uh, glossed over very quickly about, um, I think it was the testing, uh, the different user agents that might be hitting your pages. Is that is that dealing with multiple user agents or um, you said so you brought it in house? So what? Yeah, are you doing sorry. There? I uh, was it this page. I think it was a bit earlier. Ooh, this pre link checker. You sure it wasn't this page? <laughs> <laughs> No, it was definitely, yeah, maybe, maybe I mis misunderstood. Um, yeah, so uh, the, I think the only mention, I think, um, of user agent. So basically, yeah, it's older versions before version 9 of Link Checker would go off and check every single link on your, pay on your website, and including ones that point to the outside world. So it's possible that every time somebody commits something, you can hit an external server. And they can see this server is hitting their server quite a lot of times in their logs. So I think if you put something in the logs, and there have been a couple of, um, you know, cases where um, that had been noted. 
<laughs> um, so yeah, I think really the, the point I was trying to make on that slide was just if you are going to run this sort of thing in an automated way, then having a way for people who look at their logs to get in contact with you, so FastMail QA, um, hopefully that's enough to identify the company. Um, so I think this is the only reference to user agents, I think. I may have said something about Selenium, um, but I think that's the only one in the slides. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Any more? Ah, way in the front, too. Right. Hey, so a lot of the other talks we've seen today have had very, have written tests for things which are very correct or incorrect. You know, if you reverse the string, you reverse it again. There's a defined answer there. Um, whereas you're working with the website, your work, have you been working with the, um, the web client as well for the mail? Uh, sorry? The, the, the web client for fast mail. Yeah, yeah, so we have Selenium test that tests um, the functionality. That's probably a whole different talk in itself. It's all, normally um, Selenium tests are not written in Perl, but all of ours are because everything else in the company is. Um, so I kind of just glossed over that saying, we have UI functionality tests. Um, yeah, and I saw that was mentioned in other places, and so I didn't want to go into exactly how, how tests are run. Um, but yeah, we have a whole Selenium setup. Um, we use a lot of Docker. We, it's all in Perl. It basically logs in as a user, opens a Chrome browser, looks at a whole bunch of um, functionality, clicks things, makes sure stuff works as it should, and then reports back um, to, to Jenkins, so yeah. Okay, great. Do you ever have a concern that maybe Selenium chests aren't picking up something that a um, um, user going through would notice? Like yeah. loading animation doesn't come up or it flashes or something like that? Yeah, um, so the plan is to extend spot. Um, so there's things obviously, if something disappears or if the text color something changes, then Selenium isn't gonna notice that, whereas spot would. So if you're taking a screenshot of every single page, um, and the BBC Wraith tool uses PhantomJS, whereas because we've got Selenium and we're already lo loading pages, I want to kind of not have the duplication of loading a page twice, so I'm going to integrate them a bit better. Um, but when that's working, if a single pixel changes anywhere, we will notice. So we obviously do manual testing, that's where we find most of our bugs. If we're happy with that, then if a single pixel changes anywhere, um, we pick that up that way. So. Right. When you say you we do manual testing, you mean you do manual testing? I do testing? manual testing, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's only me. <laughs> On top of your automated workload? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Aside from the automated robot, yeah, it's just Sweet a test team of one, so. <laughs> They're the developers. <laughs> 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 okay, I think that's it. Okay, they thank you. I'd like to thank Chris for his presentation. Thank you very much.